My name's Simon Jackson, um, born in Australia, grew up in New Zealand, and have lived in Japan since 1992. Um, I do various things. Um, I suppose the main focus of my business is bridging Japan and other countries. Um, so I've done a lot of work between Japan and Russia, and for that business I used Otaru a lot. Um, I've also been involved in development in Niseko, which um, it's been a very interesting, interesting time and learned a lot about how Japan works or how Japan doesn't work. But, um, who, who knows the Otaru story, uh, Niseko story? Do you know Niseko? Do you know Niseko? I, I only know that it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, winter sports skiing and these types of activities. Yep. So I think it's very common for uh, tourists from other countries yep. to visit. It's, I think, got the world record for snowfall for a resort. You have 18 meters a year of snowfalls, and a lot of it's really good powder snow, which makes it interesting for foreigners to come and visit. Um, <clears throat> back when I first got to Japan, there was a few ways to show the world that you had made it. One was a Shinagawa number plate on your car. The other one was having a Niseko Beso, a Niseko second house. Then the bubble collapsed, and all of the prices just went down. And things were worth more money than you can imagine back in the Japanese bubble became worthless. And Niseko was pretty much dying. And about the turn of the century, a few sort of Australians come through, they like the snow. Snow's fantastic. I, I hate snow. I reckon it's a bad thing. But I stayed because of the skiing. I used to like skiing, but I'm sick of it. I'm finished with snow. But these crazy Australians came, and they skied, they had fun. The one of them thought, you know what? I'd like to buy something here. Can foreigners buy land in Japan? So I get a phone call. Simon, I want to buy some land. Can foreigners buy land? Yeah, it's easy. Just pay your money, go to a lawyer, he'll do the papers, it's yours. That time, um, land was selling in Hirafu, for example, for 10,000 yen a subo. A subo was 3.3 square meters, two tatami mats. So these, these uh, what call pioneering Australians found out the land was so cheap, they begged, borrowed or stole money to buy land and built some places. Then they sold them. So they bought land at Japanese prices and sold them at Australian prices. Made a lot of money. Australians are quite strange. In Australia, if you've got a house in the snow, it's worth a lot of money. In Japan, there's snow on the mountains, there's snow mid-level, there's snow in the valleys, there's snow on the beach. Snow has no value. But anyway, Australians were paying really good money for um, Niseko land. Prices went from 10,000 yen a subo up to 500,000 yen a subo. So any mathematicians here? How many percent increase is that? <laughs> Mr. Austria. 10,000? Mm, Mr. Austria. Ah, sorry. Uh, 500%. 10,000 subo to 500,000. 500%? Yeah. Is that good money? Yeah. Good increase? Yeah, I think so. So, why was it that a handful of Australians could kickstart an industry? You're talking backpackers. You're talking, the guy who did the best out there was a chef. He had a small restaurant, which mysteriously burned down. And out of his insurance payout, he bought some more land in Hirafu. Now, multi-millionaire. You've got um, backpackers, English teachers who didn't want to be English teachers, um, losers and scum, all going out there, starting business, 
and doing really well. There was no government support. There was no banking support. There was nothing. Most of these guys um, had <clears throat> no visas. Nothing. But they had ambition. Ambition and drive. And I think that seems to be something that's missing in Japan. It's everyone in Japan seems to be standing outside with their mouth open, waiting for the rain to come and give them water. They're asking Tokyo, please, please build us a build us a monorail, build us a Shinkansen. Someone help us. But it's not working. Japan is going sideways or backwards. And it has been doing that ever since I've been here. My successful business is overseas. Um, trying to do things in Japan, it's difficult because there seems to be a lack of enthusiasm for trying new things, a lack of risk taking, and a lack of financial support for young guys, people with energy to do things. If you're a if you're a 70 year old silverback in Japan, a shacho, you can walk into a bank and borrow money to invest. But when you're 70 years old, you've lost your enthusiasm, you've lost your imagination, your drive, your new ideas. Anyway, this is not about a Japan bashing exercise. It's about Otaru. So everyone obviously lives in Otaru. What Let's do a survey. Who thinks Otaru has a good future? Okay, hands up if you think Otaru has a bright, positive future. No one? No one? I don't, I don't. <laughs> okay, who thinks Otaru will just continue on at the same level? One, two, three. Who thinks it's going to continue going down the spinny? <laughs> oh dear, that's sad. Okay, um, I'd like to compare Otaru with another city, another port city that I know very well. It's something um, a friend of mine uh, studied with is the head of the Port Redevelopment Authority. And they, they've done some really fantastic things. So has anyone here been to New Zealand? Yeah? But where did you go? Wellington and Okay. So what do you think? Is Wellington bigger or smaller than bigger or smaller than um, than uh, Otaru? I think it's the same size. Yep. Yep. It's um, let me see. It's very, if you look at the population, 50 years ago, Otaru had 200,000 people. Now it's down to 134,000. Wellington had 130,000. Now it's up to 200,000. So maybe Wellington's stealing Otaru's population. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've, I've got to backtrack. Comparing Niseko and Otaru, Niseko is booming, Otaru is dying. Otaru has so much more to offer than Niseko. You look at, look at Otaru, it's, it's a port city. It's got skiing, it's got food, history, architecture. This town, this city, has the largest collection of Meiji or Taisho era Japanese interpretations of Western buildings anywhere in the world. If you look under the cladding and behind the horrible um, alterations they've done, the architecture here is fantastic. Nowhere else in the world has this architectural heritage for this, this particular era. It's, it's scenic, it's got culture, it's got so much going for it, but it's just not, not 
not happening. Okay, let's get back to, let's compare Wellington with Otaru. They're, they're both port cities. So Wellington was built around a port, it's a beautiful harbour. <clears throat> it was very lively back in the days before containerization. So when people had to load the ship by hand, a lot of waterside workers, a lot of employment. Then in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, containerization came in. So machines did the work of people. Otaru used to be a famous fishing port. It used to be the main port for Hokkaido. Then Tamakamai was built, and they put all of the containers down in Tamakamai, and Otaru as a port city slowly died. There was some business with Russian lumber, um, but that goes to different places now, so there's not much really happening. So the situation in Wellington, after containerization, the port facilities weren't needed, you had a large industrial wasteland. Now, in Otaru, down on the waterfront, you could say it's an industrial wasteland. Nothing's happening there. But um, you see that you look at the population. I was talking about population before 1960, 200,000, Wellington 124,000. 2009, Otaru 138,000, Wellington 195,000. So just going in different directions. If you look at population catchment for Otaru and Wellington, Otaru beats Wellington hands down. The Ishikari Shiribeshi region, that's the two main regions where you get population from for Otaru. Two and a half million people. In the greater Wellington region, half a million people, less than that. So it's five times population here. Hokkaido itself, even though it's going down, has five and a half million people. It's the same size as Denmark, as Ireland. It's a, quite a viable place. All of New Zealand only has just over four million people. Japan, you look at the whole of Japan, 127 million people. New Zealand still only just over four million people. If you look at the near abroad, Northeast Asia, um, Hong Kong, China, Siberia, you've got 1.5 billion people in the backyard here. If you look at New Zealand's backyard, you've got 30 million people. Australia's got 20 million, then you've got a few, Papua New Guinea's got 4 million, a few islands have got a few people. There's no one. So as far as being in a market, demographically, Otaru is fantastic. It should be doing really well. Oops. If you look at tourists, if, um, <clears throat> Otaru generally has between 7 and 10 million tourists a year, day trippers. It's fantastic. Um, Wellington has total visits 4 million, day trippers 2 million. But where Wellington beats Otaru is people stay longer. They stay an average of three days. In, in Otaru, people only stay one day. Most of the tourists come from Sapporo. They stay in hotels in Sapporo. They eat dinner in Sapporo. They have breakfast in Sapporo. They come out here quickly, walk along the canal, go along the Sakaimachi, go to the, um, uh, buy, buy a crab or something and uh, some, some glass, then go back to Sapporo and spend their money. 